Dr. Lorenz, I understand that when you were five years old, you wanted to be a duck. Well, I was afraid I've rather changed my opinion on that point. You have? A uh, naive man and children are apt to idealize animals to, in an amazing way. Clifton Thadaman is our host. His guests are Dr. Conrad Lorenz, eminent translator of the actions of animals, Fairfield Osborne, president of the New York Zoological Society, and Jacques Barzin, educator. This conversation started several minutes ago, and as we turn up our microphones, our conversationalists are discussing how much, if anything, man can learn for his own use from the study of animals. Clifton Thadaman is speaking. What can we learn from the animals as to our own instinctual patterned, predetermined human behavior. For example, I was reading in, in your book, uh, Man Meets Dog, was that it? Yes, delightful book, if I may say so. And I may say so. Uh, <laughs> that uh, that the, the dog has a certain critical distance from the human being. Beyond the critical distance, he will not be threatening to the human being. Is that correct? Well, uh, a shy dog. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> Now, it occurred to me that uh, we, as war-making human beings, are very similar. We draw a, a line around our coasts, as it were, and say, beyond this line you may not pass, because if you do pass beyond this line, you are aggressors. A territorial, territorial yes. approach, right. our now, territory. Now, we think, we think of, of uh, our, the line that we draw around our coasts as a political gesture. Whereas it's just the critical spirit. Well, uh, what I want to know is whether this is a gesture dictated by the transient necessities of uh, politics, or whether there's something deeply instinctive, precisely that's, that's the way in nice, which the dog nice uh, well, draws its mind. Nice, well, question. All right, now, Mr. Osborne, you're you're an expert. You're, I mean, you've got a zoo under your thumb. Well, so I think uh, our friend from the other side, Dr. Laurent, would back me up in the fact that one of the most compelling sources of action of animals is the territorial impulse of the preservation of their territory. Even in the lower, so-called lower forms, birds. Take your hummingbird, take your ruby throat in your own garden. But territorial protection is tremendously powerful in most animals. Well, would you extend that to say that this is the kind of instinctual behavior that is observable in animals and in more sophisticated forms comes out in people like the four of us around this table. It would be an interesting uh, conclusion to draw. But how curious, Mr. Fadiman, that uh, even in this world of uh, instinctual nature, so many things are done, apparently by instinct, that go against the interests of uh, uh, the species, the number of uh, animals who eat their young by mistake or who go to their neighbor's uh, nest and eat their young. The, uh, going against the interest. Anything pathological goes against the interest. But are those things pathological? Anything, I gathered from your book that they happen if you don't uh, well, uh, watch out. But they are miscarriages. Oh, I see. Of something which is normally absolutely of high survival value with the species. I remember, Dr. Lorenz, in your book, you, you, uh, you actually used the, the phrase face-saving with respect to the behavior of the dog. If you are ready to keep in mind all the time that human conceptual thinking, human tradition, culture, and so on, may build enormously complicated superstructures on uh, the innate, the basis of innate responses, then you have a certain justification in trying to analyze it and look for an, in, an instinctive phase. The safest way is to talk of unlearned behavior. Because what is the physiological mechanism at the base of these reactions? We do not know. We have some suspicions, but we do not know. The word instinct always implies a more or less metaphysical factor. The word instinct, instinct is loaded with uh, metaphysical prejudices. A very intelligent friend of mine has defined Ethology, uh, the attempt to take the stink out of instinct. <laughs> De smell it. <laughs> the, the, yes. the, the title of it, well, I might uh, as well say who it is. It's Frank Beach. 
from I'm Yale not University. Not that was the student. But what, what word would you prefer? That's the word that uh, Mr. Barson and I learned in, in well, school to use. Uh, we give particular names to certain types of unlearned responses. And we do not usually comprise all unlearned, all types of unlearned behavior under one conception at all. Because this conception is very prejudicing in many respects. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lawrence, the other night when you and I were having a nice, pleasant supper together over a hickory fire, you uh, brought up a very, to me, a very delightful idea of this concept. People all always talk about animals and attribute to them human uh, qualities. And, uh, you know, it goes on and on. Uh, I wish you'd, uh, I wish you'd uh, describe that to our friends tonight, because I like that very much. You brought out well, why we did that, why we say the animal is uh, like us, or we're like the animal. Yeah, the loyal dog. Yeah, the loyal yeah. dog. Well, uh, we are very often accused of humanizing, of anthropomorphizing animal behavior. And now, what we really try to do is just the opposite. We try, and we hope, you like this. to find, through the observation of animal behavior, mm -hmm. nature laws prevailing in behavior in general. Oh, common to all, uh, all animals. Common to all animals, and maybe also uh, prevailing in human behavior. Aren't you saying, then, that we're much more like animals than animals are, are like humans? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, you see, I, uh, again, we have very often been accused of underrating what Julian Huxley would call the uniqueness of man. And I think the absolute contrary of this is true. I think that nobody sees the particular and unique properties and faculties of man conceptual thought, symbolic language, morals, in the true light, unless he sees them against outlined, sharply outlined, against a very dark background, a background which is constituted by the age-old instinctual qualities which we still have in common with the higher animals. Gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to ask you now to switch on to another track. One of the things that Mr. Barson and myself, who are unlearned in animals, want to know is this. Uh, what have we actually learned during, let's say, the past 50 years, during which I know there's been a lot of experimentation and observation of animals, what have we learned from animals that can help us as human beings, if anything? Oh. I don't mean what have we learned about animals. No. But what have we learned from them? Well, let me insight into I've our got own to, I've got to ask you to break your hmm. question down into two parts. A, what have we learned that they do that we could do? That's part one. Good B, enough. what have we learned from them which affects us in our point of view? That's part well, two. Take the first. You've got A and B there. All right. What have we learned from animals that they do, which we might imitate, as it were, and, and perhaps do as well? Well, the obvious answer is flight. Oh, well, I we can't fly. We have no, no wings. No, no, There's no, nothing no, to learn from. No, no from the, aerody the aerodynamics, unquestionably, we learned an immense amount from observing the aerodynamics of birds. And at the very beginning of flying, too. So, ta uh, our, probably our greatest human enterprise today is based to a considerable degree on the early observations of birds' flight. We're getting almost as good as gulls. Yes, I think we're reverting, well, uh, in effect. I, I think what, we, what we've learned is to go backward a uh, few million I years. I should raise some objections to uh, what Mr. Osborne has just said. Please do. Uh, do you think that when the brothers right, or will, um, will the right, for the first time, there was very much um, imitation of bird flight in their apparatus. No, they I can answer that as it happens, Dr. Lorenz. I happen just by chance to have a piece of information on that. They were in correspondence with a French consular 
officer at Cairo who wrote to them his observation of seagulls there. Yeah. And he uh, told them that he thought that if you could uh, tip the wing in a certain way, then you could bank and, and, uh, and turn, because one of the problems was how to um, go in the direction you wanted, not simply fly straight sure. on forever. Yeah. I think that is uh, historically authenticated. Well, no, it is well I yes. object again. The airplane does everything just in the opposite way as the bird does. A, the propeller. The invention of the axle and the wheel are something which does not occur anywhere in the animal kingdom. Oh, yes, but this wasn't imitating the whole well, bird. But just, just the, the, tip the, of wing. the sideways balance of a bird is done with a tail. And the left and right steering is done with the wing. Well, On the airplane, it's the opposite. The sideways balancing is done with the wings. And that's exactly the thing which uh, the Wrights invented. Which well, they went Lilienthal, on to that, yes. Which Lilienthal had not. But just this uh, major invention of keeping the balance, the sideways equilibrium of the plane, is a thing which they could never, never have learned from a bird. Then what becomes of Mr. Osborne's statement? Mr. Osborne did make the statement that we have learned from the structure and behavior of the bird, in some respect, how to fly. Man said, here these rather stupid birds, they can fly. Let's do it better. Let's do it better. But we I mean, that learn? was involved. Now, if you say how much did they learn from the point of aerodynamics, uh, Mr. Barzan uh, quotes the latter. The impulses of streamlining and so forth and body form. I'm not, a, I'm not an aero uh, engineer, I don't know. But I, I might remark that the right, the first effort was not a very good effort. And there's a lot of uh, engineering involved, I think, in the, uh, uh, in the present oh. airplane, irrespective of where the propeller is and the motive power, which has learned a good deal from the uh, aerodynamic capacities of birds. Well, but if you compare the Orville Wright plane yes. with a very, very modern plane, oh, yes. you will find that the modern plane is very, very much more bird-like. Good. Rather than ask you what we have learned technologically, I'm going to ask you what we have learned socially. Is there anything that animals do among themselves as societies which can be of value to us as part of a society? That seems to be far more important than flying or than uh, learning how to construct submarines or whatever. Can we learn to live better with each other by observing animals? Oh. Oh, just by learning, but ugly things they do that we ought ugly not to do. Ugly or beautiful, I don't know. Well, I should, I should put it like this. Of course, in studying animals, we learn a lot of natural laws that apply to our own behavior. Would you name some of them? This is precisely what I'd like well, to Well, uh, take the inhibitions to kill fellow members of, of the species. The whole very complicated mechanisms that prevent, uh, well, asocial behavior in jackdaws, in dogs, in any kind of uh, gregarious animal. And uh, there are some implications. We've learned this thing, uh, you say? Oh, oh, just well, observed it. It. But I object to the, uh, to, to the way of putting it, uh, that we learned it from them, you see. We didn't learn uh, a physiologist who has worked a lot on guinea pigs wouldn't say that he has learned physiology from the guinea pigs. He has learned it on guinea pigs. And How does he apply it? Uh, one well, of the things we wanted to find out is, what good does it do us as human animals to observe as carefully as Mr. Osborne and yourself, Dr. Lorenz, have observed animals? What, what, how can we apply what we learn from them? Or is this merely a set of scientific observations? I, I think the question has got to divide itself still in two parts. We, we may learn from animals as to things they do which we can imitate and then do better. Because actually there's no animal who can't, to a certain degree, do everything, even our modern inventions. Bats have sound sonar. Uh, there's a fish that can shoot a stream up and, and, put and catch an insect up in the air. Uh, there's deep diving. There's all kinds of things that the animal world does that we've imitated physically. One good example for what Mr. Osborne has just said is a thing which was discovered very lately by Carl von Frisch, 
that is that bees and probably very many insects orient themselves, navigate by the plane of polarization of the light reflected from the blue sky by a comparatively very simple apparatus. You can orient yourself. And this apparatus has lately been imitated. The bees apparatus has actually been imitated by, uh, for polar navigation. We have no sun at your disposal but a blue sky. But didn't we have to find out all sorts of other things before we could even discover that, which, without uh, the bees or the pigeons or whoever they are, uh, we would have discovered too. That is, isn't it, without it being convergent adaptation, uh, it's something almost like it. And if we know that much, we're going to know as much as the bees in ten minutes, and we don't need them. Uh, there's another example, Clifton Fadim, and now during the last 10 years, we have in the Bronx Zoo approximately 80 electric eels. The, uh, Shocking. Sh plenty. Yeah, 500 yeah. volts per large animal. Plenty. But the payoff on your question, part of it, the physical knowledge we can get, is the interrogations that are being made with our electric eels, which are being studied by medical centers, and we're trying to find out how mm -hmm. so much can be generated from a very small biological generating station that turns up 500 volts at the tail of an eel. Mm. We haven't learned that, but the fact that it exists and we know it exists poses a tremendous inter interrogatory question among electrical engineers. What, this, what is this thing that animals have got physically that we haven't got? Yeah, uh, it'll probably uh, influence uh, high fidelity recording, don't you think, when we've got those yes, faster impulses? I think what we'll do is duplicate a lot of the, uh, of the behavior mechanisms of lower organisms. Seems to me this kind of reversion. What have we learned from the animals that can help, help us to become better animals and not animals more like those below us in the organic scale? You mean scale? A on a moral scale? Well, yes, should, if you will, Mr. Well, Osborne. Uh, I mean, that's I, a big word, and, that's, and, and that's maybe the, I shouldn't use it. Maybe that's the second part of my question. All I right, think now you advance points. it. Well, I, it's not easy because it's tenuous things you've got to deal with. But I think uh, if you, if you took, take it from another context, a man's relationship with the natural world and the beauty he finds in observing the natural world and the life of animals, and I'm sure Dr. Lorenz, who, with all his technical skills, is still primarily an admirer of this thing, which is the animal world. What's that give people? I don't know. What's a great picture give people? What does a great exquisite scene give people? What happens to people when they see flights of birds against an autumn sky, or the song of birds in the spring. And large, and, I mean, enlarge yes. their sense of their kinship with the whole, with the whole with the world. With the whole living world with around them. Makes, that's another makes part, sense you see. To that's not the practical no, part. I, I, that's the that, that makes more sense to me than, than learning how to fly. But there's one, one thing that seems to me even more important than a purely aesthetic response, because that's been pretty well drilled into us for the last 150 years, and, and we have it. It seems to me that the latest observations uh, teach us something about the natural world that we human beings find particularly hard to learn, and that is the lesson of variety, and a kind of needless variety. Needless in the sense that if you have this species, you don't need that one, intellectually speaking. There's no necessity for it, but we are given it. Do you see what well, I mean? But it isn't uh. given to us. I mean, you Why are. Not? this question is highly anthropocentric. I no, mean, no, the, look, let's, the, let's be reasonable about this. We start from Mr. Osborne's excellent point of what man watching the universe. What does he see? He sees the, uh, the beauty, the harmony, the uh, interconnectedness of things. Right. But he also sees, it seems to me, a profusion, a diversity, which goes against all our other uh, political, social habits, where we try to make things all alike, where we want conformity, are, singleness. Are we right? Or are we are wrong, right. and uh, yeah. I'm answering Mr. Fadiman's question, who said, what can we learn from the animal no, kingdom? Good. This is a very <laughs> profound political lesson. <laughs> what Mr. Barzin is saying is that uniformity is against nature. That if we look at nature and find large numbers of apparently needless, but certainly picturesque and interesting species, that uh, enforces the lesson, uh, enlarge those species and uh, genera among yourselves. Yes, Mr. Fadiman, but we are one species. And oh, yes, among true. We are one species, humans are one species, and amongst animal and plant species, the human species is the most variable one, is the one with the greatest 
breadth of variability known to science. Which it resists. And which is uh, one of the conditions of culture. Because if men were as alike to each other as wild manners, we would or wild uh, stags, or elk, or whatever, what have you, are, yeah. you wouldn't have uh, the material for the division of labor, which is one of the main conditions of culture. Yeah, so I think we are the most variable of all animals, and it is well that we are. Perfectly. But man doesn't recognize his own variability, by and large. He, he says, uh, so-and-so is a foreigner or has a skin of a different color. He's not even a man, because he is not like me. All right, you can't convince him uh, out of that prejudice without great labor. But we can turn him to nature and say, look, look at uh, nature. And uh, nothing in it is really quite like anything else, even two specimens of one uh, variety of one species of plant. Not quite the same, of course. Exactly. <laughs> I'd like to come back to one thing that Mr. Ferryman has just said a short time ago. That is that man might learn to become a better animal. And now, from my point of view, I think I have to object to this. You see, just in those particular respects to which values attach, Man is so much qualitatively different from animals that just there I quite agree that we are animals. But just these few respects to which moral values attach are something that just simply does not exist in the animal kingdom. Ah, I must say I agree with you. Good, I'm glad you said that. I, I, uh, I, I must take the traditional religious point of view. I think we have, uh, first place, I think we have immortal souls and animals do not. Uh, I also think we are rational intellects, and animals have none. Well, and it's precisely because of that gulf between us and the animal kingdom that animals seem to me merely interesting things to observe, rather than things from which we can learn profound lessons. Uh, a rational mind can learn from anything. You know, old Confucius, Kung Fu Tse, said once a very wise thing. He said, there's all animal contained in man but not all man contained in the animals. And this is a very wise say. It, in other words, it means, in respect to the deep layers of our personality, the, all these types of unlearned so-called instinctual behavior, we are very, very much like animals. We are practically the same. We are animals in these respects. But, the dramatic change, evolutional change, qualitative change from yeah. animal to man, which lies in the sudden evolution of speech, conceptual thought, culture, are something which is not paralleled in any animal that lived before the creation of humans. Now, granted, but if you make uh, a kind of proportion, uh, don't you find the, the same limitation uh, in man? You, you remember, surely, your water shrews that kept going over uh, an obstacle that you had removed over and over again before they decided to learn uh, a different path. Well, uh, don't you find in society uh, people behaving exactly that way on their level of rational conceptual thought. Now, granted that uh, they're way above the water shrews, still uh, we have a right to expect more of them than they seem able to give with their uh, <coughs> rational well, conceptual minds. And isn't that what makes us sometimes sink back in despair at uh, the human race to which well, we belong? You see, the last thing to which the evolutionist is given is pessimism and despair. Oh, he'd be out of business if he ever the, uh, agreed. Uh, uh, I always say in a joking manner that I think uh, the missing link between animal kingdom and humanity is about to be found. You know, and the missing link, that's us. <laughs> Meaning that we have a fair chance that's very of profound. developing into uh, peaceful uh, human beings in the 
few thousand years, mm -hmm. which is nothing uh, in the measure of time and you, nothing to you, you, use, you use in evolution. But uh, you, you're on both sides of the fence, aren't you? you? The last sentence in your book is, we may well be apprehensive. Now, if you're not... Oh, uh, well, uh, I'm terribly apprehensive, but I hope for the best. I know, but what a, what a thing to leave in the mind of the, the person who's followed you with delight well, through all the uh, mazes of your... Uh, yes, if after a couple of hundred thousand years of development away from the animals, you are still afraid that we were so stupid that we would destroy ourselves as an animal species... We will be missing uh, indeed. Oh, we might. I don't the think Conrad that. Lawrence means that in those words, despite they are the concluding words to his book. He's giving us a little moral challenge there at the end. <laughs> it is just uh, uh, a slight hint at the responsibility. That's it. I think that is what's back of your thought. Well, now, uh, we during the last 50 years, let me now try to, to uh, sum this up. During the last 50 years, our observation of animals has been of a very different kind than that before, let's say, 1900. Oh, please, sir, do you mind going back uh, 90 Martin, years to Charles Darwin? Because, after all, he did pull a trick on us, you know? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll agree, but the sort that of thing... Oh, don't uh, forget yeah, Darwin. The sort of thing, Mr. Osborne, that you were doing up at the New York Zoological Society, observing animals uh, not uh, on a conditioned basis, but seeing how they actually act in large areas suitable and natural to them, is a new idea. It's relatively a 20th century idea, surely. Uh, the sort of thing that Dr. Lorenz is doing, gathering numbers of animals around him and allowing them free play and seeing what their behavior patterns really are, irrespective of what the psychologists would like to find out that they are, mm. this is something new. Now, during the last 50 years, what have we learned, if we can sum this up, from that kind of new observation? Uh, the main thing we can abstract from the findings of the last 20 years is that things are always more complicated than you suspected when you started to analyze them. And the assumption that everything can be explained on one principle, whether it is that of conditioned response alone or of instinct alone, are always bound to be entirely fallacious. And the real inference is never to generalize. My friend Otto Köhler once said that today's truth is not tomorrow's error, but today's truth is the special case of tomorrow. Oh, that's and I think nice. that is a very deep uh, saying. Very good indeed. 